something a little bit lighter. And uh, in particular, something that Amir has not worked on, my history with Amir is, is that very often we start discussing problems and I lure him into working on problems. I hope this will, be, this is what will happen here, but it's somewhat harder if you know. <laughs> I, do, I do my best. <laughs> okay, so, uh, let me tell you about a, an empirical fact that I found somewhat surprising the first time I was exposed to it. So this is a matrix, this is an impotent matrix, and we call it a colloquially the maximal impotent matrix. Okay, so it's just one golden block with one above the diagonal and zero on the diagonal. And we are interested in the space. So um, that's particularly easy for this matrix because the characteristic polynomial is just z to the power n, and we all know what the roots of z to the power n are. So all the eigenvalues are zero. However, um, if you go to your computer, you tell your computer to do the following. Please sample for me a random unitary matrix conjugate this matrix J and T n and J n are the same, generally state. U n, J n, U n star. And, okay, what's the spectrum of the new matrix? That's particularly easy, it's still zero. But when you ask the computer to do that, that's what the computer tells you. So that's, a, I don't know, 1,000 or 5,000 by 5,000. So the zeros, most of the zeros are on the unit circle, and there are a few zeros inside the circle, no zeros outside. Mm -hmm. K and L. Yeah. I said J and T are the same general dyslexia. Okay? So I find this empirical fact surprising. And there's no zero here. Sorry? <laughs> zero is not one of the spectral points. Yes. Yes, zero in particular is not one of the spectral points. If that's what the computer says, the computer must be right. So something is going on, and, and this talk is about, is about what is going on. So I should say that people in numerical analysis know these things and have known these things for many, many years. In particular, uh, this goes back to an important notion introduced by Trefferton and co-workers co starting from the early 90s which goes by the name of pseudo-spectrum. So pseudo-spectrum basically measures a worst-case type of uh, disturbance. Take your matrix and allow me to add a tiny, no a tiny perturbation with a small norm. How far will the resolvent move? What will be the effect on the resolvent, which is the same as asking a question, uh, what will be the effect on the spectrum? Okay? So it's well known that it's instable. But what these studies don't tell you what happens 
we know where could it go, but not where will it go, actually, for in reaction to different situations. So uh, let me give you a, a very quickly a little bit of background. So of course, for a matrix, we have singular values. Um, if the matrix is symmetric, the singular values or the absolute values or the eigenvalues, it's not quite right. There's an ordering issue in what I wrote, but let's forget about that for a moment. Um, and then there are stability properties. So the singular values of a matrix are stable. If you move a little bit your matrix, say by small perturbation, the singular values will not move much. And for, for Hermitian matrices, where the singular values and the eigenvalues are the same, uh, if you add a small perturbation, then the eigenvalues just don't move very much. Uh, in particular, if you take your favorite Hermitian matrix and you add to it a Wigner matrix scaled down such that the norm goes to zero, which means in this particular notation gamma larger than one half, then the spectrum just converge to the original spectrum, nothing interesting. Okay, questions so far? Well, that's the first demo. And of course, no such control holds for eigenvalues of non-emission matrices, otherwise I would, have, I would give a different talk. So the, the other background is just for, for common Language, so a Ginevri matrix is just a, a matrix of IID uh, complex Gaussians. And everything essentially is known about such matrices to a huge level of precision. In particular, certainly we know the empirical measure of eigenvalues. And yeah, this is a circular law. The empirical measure of eigenvalues converges to the uniform of the unit disk. Since I don't do simulations, everything is stolen. In particular, here I was not careful, and I stole a simulation of real Ginevri matrix. You can see that by the gap. I don't want to be lying, but okay. Never mind. Very good. In fact, it's not only the eigenvalues that converge, but also the norm of a singular of a Ginevri matrix converges. So the top singular value converges to square root two. So if we scale it as we said before. Mainly, we multiply by n to the minus gamma as a matrix of IID Gaussians. If gamma is larger than half, the norm goes to zero. Okay? And that will be uh, a particular perturbation. Now, for this particular type of noise, there's a theorem that goes back now maybe 15 years to Walter Shinyagi, motivated by uh, non commutative probability which says the following. Suppose that AN is a sequence of matrices of dimension N that converges in star moments, I'll say what that means, to an operator A in some uh, non-commutative probability space, but if you don't know what that is, forget it. It's not important for the case. So suppose that, what does that statement mean? It means that traces of polynomials in A and its adjoint converge to the corresponding object on the right hand side. For any such polynomial, the trace of the left hand side converges to the trace of the right side. Okay? And now take a perturbation, AN, which is AN plus T times N to the minus one half GN. So now we take a Ginevri matrix which has singular values of order one, that's a scaling, and we multiply by T, the parameter T. Then the theorem is that if uh, you take the order of limits, where well, first you take the dimension T infinity, and then T to zero, you can read the limit of that object, of the eigenvalues, of the empirical measure of eigenvalues, as the Brown measure associated with A. Basically, you look at uh, uh, the log potential given by A. Namely, you look at Z minus A, you take the uh, positive part of Z minus A times Z minus A star, that's a positive operator, and the log the integral of log against that positive operator will give you 
a certain function on the complex plane, it's function of z, and that will be the log potential of a measure. That measure is called the Brown measure. Okay? So, so, so we know what the limit is, but of course, the order of limits is, is important. First, the dimension goes to infinity, then t goes to zero. And what this implies by an easy diagonalization is that you can take some sequence of t that goes to zero, and then you know what the limit will be. That's by a diagonal. So the, I'm not going to say too much about the proof, just to mention one beautiful little observation, which is really the heart of the argument. Uh, anybody who worked with non emission matrices knows that at some point control of small singular values is going to be crucial. And the main ingredient of the proof is a stochastic. So, so when you do that, you can realize it uh, uh, by adding a Brownian motion instead of a particular uh, noise. So you can write equations for the singular values of that. They satisfy a version of Dyson Brownian motion. And what Schneady observed is that when you look at the singular values, the evolution of singular values, monotonicity is preserved. So in particular, the collection of singular values of if a time if you start that evolution with two different initial conditions and one dominates the other, that monotonicity will be preserved by the evolution. And uh, this means that you can control the small singular values of this matrix by the small singular value of that matrix, which are well understood. And using that, Sinyadi was able to prove this Okay. So, so once you have this controller, you can control the determinant of z minus this matrix, and from that you get the log potential that I mentioned. So the, the main question I want to address is what happens when we take Tm to zero. This is particularly important if you have in mind the numerical motivation. By the way, I should already say from the beginning, from the onset, that I will have nothing to say about what the stupid computer does. I have no idea. But I will have uh, other models in which the behavior will be seen. So that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, but certainly, whatever the computer does, the noise in the computer is certainly very small. It certainly has norm going to zero and even going to zero fast. OK. So uh, let's go back to the example I started with, this maximum input of matrix. And And now let's take gamma larger than one half and look at this matrix. Okay, so that's the perturbed matrix that we discussed earlier. But now perturbed by IID complex stuff, actually complex of really big matrix. And the COM that we proved a few years ago with, uh, with Alice and with uh, Philip Wood is that indeed the empirical measure converges to what you saw in that computer simulation. So it converges to a uniform measure of the unit system. Okay? So, uh, uh, so, so this means that even when this goes to zero, by the, you, see, you will note that there is no upper bound on gamma. So any polynomial is enough to have any small polynomially decreasing perturbation to get, uh, to get uh, um, which is a Brown measure for the operator A. So if you look at A star, so A plus A star is actually the bill of Laplacian. The, not the bill of Laplacian, the, the Laplacian, not the Laplacian in the sense. It's the Laplacian, the discrete Laplacian, A plus A star. For that, and this was generalized short, shortly after by Philip to general IIDGF. So, uh, and, 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 and this is actually a simulation of that for reasons that not of the random dimension, but exactly of this. Okay, so what, what is really going on? So, so again, if you go to a numerical analyst, they will 
tell you, look, what you should look at is at this matrix, where you put here an entry which is delta n. So delta n is some small uh, parameter. And let's try to analyze the spectrum of this matrix. So this we can do. Even I can compute the determinant of z minus that. And the determinant of z minus j is just z to the power n plus or minus depending on vanity and on error that I'm making delta n. In particular, the eigenvalues are exactly the nth root of delta n multiplied by the n roots of unity. So first of all, you see that you get something circular, right? The empirical measure will converge to something uniform on the circle. And second, what is the modulus of that? It's delta n to the power one over n. So as soon as delta n, as soon as delta n goes to zero polynomially, delta n to the power one over n actually goes to one. So we found a perturbation that would create this crazy uh, uh, instability of n. Okay? So this immediately leads up to two questions. First of all, this is a very special example of what happens in other situations. And second, why does the noise pick up this particular perturbation? There are all sorts of other perturbations you could add which would not have that. So, uh, so here is a general theorem that appears in the same paper as that, that the main theorem is the paper. So suppose that A, remember, we are dealing with situations in which we have a sequence of matrices that converge in star moment to some operator A. And suppose that A is regular in the sense that uh, somehow you, you, you don't charge zero. Z minus A does not charge zero too much. So that's a way mu AZ is a spectral measure of the modulus of A minus Z. Okay, A minus Z times A minus Z star to the power one half. And you want that this thing does not when epsilon goes to zero, then it goes to zero. Okay. So you want not delta, delta, is psi. delta is a Flaschen, psi is a test function, and uh, psi is f. It's the same. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, <coughs> thank you. So the theorem is that if you have the same convergence as we had before, and the empirical measure of eigenvalues of A converges to the Brown measure associated with A. Okay. If these two conditions hold, then noise does nothing. Okay? Is the theorem clear? So if we have both convergence in star moment and the empirical measure mm -hmm. converges, the noise does not destroy. Right? No, Ln is the empirical measure of A alone, without noise. And here I add noise. I'm assuming something about A. A is my matrix unperturbed. No, when you add noise, we're still going to zero. There's an order of limit. Again, Sniadi told you take first n to infinity, then t to zero. I'm taking a noise that goes to zero together with n. You cannot get rid of this interchange of order of limits. And you certainly cannot go to Sniadi theorem. Sniadi theorem will tell you that there exists some sequence that goes to zero such that this is true. But it certainly does not tell you that it, I mean, it certainly does not tell you that this is true for any sequence that goes to zero for me. Okay. Uh, but why is this? So I'm not going to say the proof is not hard, but I'm not going to explain why, why, why that is true. Uh, however, this does. So we didn't start with a matrix that satisfies that, right? Because in our situation, Ln of A went to a Dirac at zero, it was equal to a Dirac at zero. So we certainly did not satisfy the conditions of this zero. So why do I tell you about this zero? Well, uh, we have a second theorem that says 
if you can find a, a perturbation that goes to zero polynomial, such that ln of a plus the perturbation goes to u a, then the noisily perturbed of the original matrix will go to u a. In the case of the maximal big potent, I told you what e n is. It's just this element with delta <coughs> n in the lower both. Okay? So it's enough to find a perturbation. In the case of the maximal big potent, it's easy. And, uh, okay. Okay, so that's a particular case that one can do. <coughs> and now, because it's late, I want to show you a few additional features. So the question is, how, how does that generalize? This does not give you a recipe how to find this perturbation or anything like that. So here are more general models. So this is a matrix J plus J squared. So J plus J squared is simply the matrix, which is one and one more one. Okay? It's, it's this particular important. And now, what you see are two simulations. On the blue, on the right side, is a stupid computer. What will you tell him to do what I told you in the beginning to do? Maybe conjugate, randomly conjugate a computer spectrum. And on the left, you see various simulations with different noises, different colors corresponding to them. So it's again striking. There is some curve, and you see that somehow the eigenvalues go to this curve, most of the eigenvalues. I think that the dimension here is 4,000 or 5,000, I can remember. And there are a few outliers. So you get this nice limit. Here are other examples. So uh, let me explain what is a So th those are now bidiagonal matrices. Those are now bidiagonal matrices where we have one on the upper diagonal, and the first thing is just you start from minus one and you go all the way to one, or maybe even from minus two, minus two, and you go all the way to two, linearly. Okay? Is the model clear? And now you look, again, computer, random conjugation versus additive noise. So, 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 okay, it's hard not to see the relation, but at least the shape looks similar. This example is an example where you, instead of ordering the elements on the diagonal, you just take, <coughs> so, IIDs on the diagonal, which are uniformly distributed on the interval minus two. And again, you have convergence to these curves, of course, the convergence, the speed of convergence depends on the noise and the dimension, and it's hard to simulate, but, but uh, okay. eventually the theorem is going to be that it converges no matter what the noise is to the same. So here is the theorem obtained jointly with uh, Anirudan Asak, who is here, and then it's okay. Uh, <coughs> So if we take uh, uh, the uniform, the IID uniform case, then uh, what we will say, what we will see is that the empirical measure converges to a certain measure mu, and mu is explicit in the sense that the log potential of mu, the integral of log of z minus x mu of dx, converges to exactly this function. Okay? D1, D is just the element on the diagonal. The proof, uh, the proof is uh, based on the log of potential of the second one, right? The proof? Based, yeah. The proof is based on computing the log potential of the matrix. Yes. So you can identify the limit by using that expression. You do the log of the you got uh, some, some formula, so you recover I'll, I'll say something about the proof. Okay. okay. But yes, the log potential is always for long emission matrices, the log potential is important. And uh, more 
generally, if we take a Toplitz matrix, uh, the limit is particularly simple to this one. So if you take an upper diagonal Toplitz matrix, sum of a i j to the power i, so this is just going to be a matrix which looks like a zero, then a one, etc., up to a k. So you take a banded Toplitz upper triangular matrix. Then after perturbation, so LN is an empirical measure after perturbation, it converges to the law of this simple random variable. So U is a uniform random variable on the circle. And you take sum of AI U to the power I. This gives you a random variable. The law of that random variable is the limit of LN. So in particular, the example I started, the maximum nil potent, all a i are equal to zero except for i equal one. So you just get the law of the uniform on this. Okay. Is that clear? Yes. Sir. I mean, is that out and out here the same thing? L is an empirical measure of vacuum vector. Oh, it's a different. I'm not sure I understand the question. TL is a matrix and LN is an empirical measure of vacuum vector. Or the tattoo, of course. The, the actual matrix is upper diagonal, upper triangular. So, so the, the empirical measure of the original ma matrix is just delta at zero. Period. Okay. Good. And this extends to what is called twisted toplets. So, what does twisted toplets mean? It means suppose that this AI now changes slowly as a regular function, like in the example I gave you between minus two and two. So suppose that AI is some nice function, uh, AI of J over N, where J is the distance of this diagonal. Then what you get for LN is a convex combination of such objects. The convex combination given exactly by this parameter of T, and that's what you saw if we go back to the simulation. This is what you see in the first. That's exactly what you see. So, so remember, if A was constant, it was just a circle centered at a particular point. And when you move that circle, you, get, you move from here to here, and you drag with the radio. So it's just a complex combination. While that picture was still on the board, I mean, so this is very closely related to the work of Goldscheid and Kurajenko. This one, yeah. this one, yes. this one, yes. But you're not making those connections in this talk, or? So, so it's very different. The curves are the same, but the, resu the, the, the results are very different because what, 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 uh, um, what they are talking about is unperturbed matrices in which the coefficients are independent and they had upper diagonal and lower diagonal. So, so the noise was of order one, but there was no additive noise. Now remember that my matrix is upper diagonal. So without the additive noise, the empirical measure is just the empirical measure of the diagonal, so it will be uniform on the interval minus two. So it's true that you get spectral curves, but the nature of these spectral curves is different. They have the same shape. Yes. Something, Something happened, and I'll, I'll try to explain. I'll try to explain your the last theorem. theorem was very closely related to the counts for a single. Theorem. Yes. Yes. Although, again, none of these deal with parameter perturbations of fixed operators. Right. <coughs> okay. So, uh, So I should say that, that some of this picture already appeared in the work of Freifetten, although he was never interested in the convergence of the empirical measure, just in the locus of eigenvalues of the perturbed operators. And some two diagonal toplitz cases were also analyzed by Schuster and Bruegel in the last case. Okay. So let me say something about the proof not of the random case, not of the one which is related to Kolchai and Zenko, but actually to the Toplitz case. Because uh, there's a very general theorem that I would like to 
So, so take Tn and write it. This is our matrix. So, so I'm writing the matrix as a. I have a general matrix M n now, plus n to the minus gamma g, where g is gamma, complex gamma. And fix a z complex and write z i minus m. You can write a singular value of the composition of z i minus m. So it's diagonal. Let's arrange it in a non-decreasing order. And then I can take my sigma as two blocks, right? Two diagonals. I, I, I'm not telling you yet how to divide it. But here are going to be the small singular values of the matrix sigma. And here are going to be the large sigma. And this is a noise. The noise is four blocks, right? With the dimensions corresponding to the same dimension. And I didn't say what n star is, but uh, for the there is a formula. For the purpose of this talk, think of n star as being some small polynomial in n. So one over n to some power, to some small power. So here you are capturing together the small singular values of the, the of this matrix uh, sigma, of the diagonal matrix sigma. And the COM is what we call a deterministic equivalent, which says it's following. If this n star, which is determined in terms of the singular values of the matrix, is not too large, okay, then the log determinant of the noisy matrix converges to just the determinant of Vm. So what you should do, the difference between the uh, original determinant, so if, if M is upper triangular, this thing only depends, the determinant of sigma N only depends on the diagonal elements. However, uh, uh, what we say is that you should throw away the small singular values. And that's what you will see after you apply this. And that's not a hard, once you realize that this is going on, it's not hard to do. It's basically a concentration of measure arguments. So that gives you a method of computing everything, right? You give me your favorite top list upper triangular matrix. All I have to do is shift it by Z and compute the singular value. Um, indeed, this is what we did in, in, uh, in the paper. Uh, maybe I want to skip the reformulation. There is a reformulation in terms of Lyapunov exponents, and that's the link with the work of Gorchai and Kukulenko, but I'm running out of time. So, so, so this is a result we had uh, last year, and I want to tell you a few, uh, a few uh, recent so you will note that I was talking all the time about upper triangular matrices. And the reason I was discussing upper triangular matrices is that it turns out that even after you shift, you need to compute certain determinants. And for upper triangular matrices, computing determinants is particularly difficult. So we were asking ourselves, can we do so there are two directions in which we wanted to generalize this. Of course, maybe I should, I should explain one thing. This deterministic equivalence result is completely general. It doesn't depend on upper triangular or lower triangular. It's completely general. However, when you are trying to compute the singular values of zi minus m, if you are upper triangular, that's much simpler because you can get recursions. It's much easier to compute the singular values of upper triangular matrices than it is to compute the singular values. In particular, to compute, say, the determinant of general top list matrices, which are not permission, is not easy. There's a whole literature on this question, and it's a non trivial fact. And while I'm at this, an important So, so there are two directions we want to understand. We want to understand non-upper triangular, and we want to understand more general models of noise. The reason we, this deterministic equivalence, the first step in the proof 
is to do a conjugation and claim that the noise doesn't change by conjugation. This is true for Gaussian complex noise. It is certainly not true for Gaussian real noise. If you conjugate by a Hermitian matrix, the distribution changes. By a unitary matrix, the distribution changes. In particular, you don't have a real Gaussian noise. So uh, we wanted to get rid of that because the computer simulations tell us that, in fact, for very general noises, the, the result should be the same. Rounding arrows are producing the same results in the numerical algorithms. So, so, so here is where we are in that respect. So suppose that we have uh, a noise matrix which satisfies the following two conditions. There's a condition of normalization, which has to do with, uh, with the hilbert schmidt norm of the matrix. And there is some control on small singular values. Then if you take this matrix, you shift it by a deterministic matrix which is small, the small singular value is not too small. This is true, this, has been, this kind of property has been proven true for very general noise, IID noise, certain random graphs, Nick has uh, spent uh, part of his uh, professional life working on such questions, uh, random sum of random permutations, there are lots of models for which this will be true. And the general result is the following. If you take a Toplitz operator, so sum of ai, j to the i, where now when I say j to a negative power, of course j is not invertible, but it's just a transpose. Okay? So this is just a shorthand notation for the, this equality is just a, a definition of j to the minus one. So this is a Toplitz two-sided Toplitz matrix of finite symbol. Then, and, and suppose a G satisfies these assumptions. Then, uh, the limit of the empirical measure is exactly. Okay. Uh, oh yes, yes, you are. Right. This is uh, this is a mistake. This should go from minus. This is copy paste. This is from my, from K one. So, uh, in fact, the proof does not go through the deterministic equivalence, because we do not have a deterministic equivalence for general noise. But it mimics, in some sense, the, the, the result I started with in the following sense. Uh, we first, there is a two step procedure. First, we find a perturbation, but we don't know how to find an explicit perturbation, so we just take a random perturbation. And we show that the random perturbation has a good property. Once we have found the random perturbation, we apply a variant of the first theorem convention, namely, uh, so, so first there is a, this, this is what allows us to do that, so that's a replacement principle. You don't need to, to read all the, all the conditions, but basically delta is a perturbation. G is a noise matrix satisfying the assumptions I said before. And, and uh, uh, the main condition is that the log potential of A plus delta converges to the log potential of mu. Then uh, you have, so this is after the perturbation, then you have the same result as you just had. So this is a similar theorem to the first theorem we started with except that now we allow for random perturbation, and the point is that for Toplitz matrices, we can identify this we just we, we, we can find a random matrix, but then the but then this is okay. So, 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 question here. Ah, question, we still have, oh, how much time? Five minutes? Yeah, five minutes. So, uh, I, I, I. So what is the limitation of this theorem? You have noted that this deals with toplitz operators, but it does not deal with twisted toplitz operators. In particular, twisted toplitz means that this A changed nicely and smoothly along the diagonal. So in the upper triangular case, we had a theorem for that. But now we have a lower triangular, and I'm asking that. The reason we cannot do that is, okay, one of the reasons, but an important one that if someone in the audience has any knowledge would be interested. For complex matrices, there's 
the COM of widow that gives you the answer what is the, the asymptotic, the exponential asymptotics of the topic determinant, of the determinant of the topic. So what widow you just did it for Casper or Sergio Sego measures and, and in the paper that I wrote. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, you don't know your code. So, 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 50 years later. But I know, okay, no, we're going to argue about that later. But anyway, there's a formula, there's a formula about the determinant of the logarithmic asymptotics of determinants of complex matrices. For twisted complex matrices, namely when these coefficients change with time, I am not aware of a single result. And in fact, the, the only results I'm aware of are in results where the winding number, which I don't want to define, is zero for the symbol of the wave. So uniformly over the parameter P, the winding number is zero, which will typically not be the same. So, uh, so we don't know. So we cannot handle the, the, the twisted complex, and we don't have a replacement principle. We cannot do recursion. So, so that's a, so that's one severe limitation of what we have to do. The other thing I wanted to mention is work in process in progress with Anilvan, uh, which are outliers. So if you go back to the simulations, you will know that most of the eigenvalues are on these limiting curves which are the push forward by the symbol of the disk. The, not the disk, the sector. But there are eigenvalues inside. And you might, it's a very natural question to, to ask what, what, what are these outliers? So as Nick pointed out to me, inliers. <laughs> you can show there are no outliers outside the image. That's relatively easy to show. So all those in the in, inside. And it turns out to be interesting. Um, so, so, so as example of the results we have, if you take the maximum nilpotent, the, the inliers inside the unit circle are simply zeros of a certain Gaussian field that we can identify. If you look at Jn plus Jn squared, plus a noise, so this is two diagonal above, then you can always rewrite the, your matrix as lambda one minus j times lambda two minus j, and everything depends on how many, as a function of z, how many of the lambdas are larger or smaller in modulus than one. So uh, there are no outliers if both are larger than one, and this is the outlier part of the story. Uh, in the region where there is only one, we get a Gaussian field. And in the region where there are two, the outliers are roots of a certain term that we can identify, of a certain field that can be well approximated by, by uh, a polynomial. But it involves not one Gaussian, but rather two products of a pair of Gaussians. So it's not a Gaussian field anymore some kind of field, um, we can identify it, and there is a similar shift theorem in the general case. Everything depends on how many of these roots of the symbol, of the shifted symbol, are smaller or larger than one. Um, yeah, let me, let me skip. So, open question. So, first of all, I already mentioned the, the question with twisted, uh, complete symbol, we, we, we expect a mixture, exactly like in the triangular case, but we don't know for sure at the moment. And another very natural question, suppose you have a, a toplitz, but with infinite symbol, not finite symbol. So things should depend on the rate of decay of that symbol. If it decays very fast, the result should be stable. If it decays slowly, or will be since it's the last talk, I think it's a good time for all of us to thank the whole of the
search for an in Denver, this is picture number four, and this is actually the first book that comes out. <laughs> Are there any more comments or questions for? Yes, the curve is a push forward of the unit circle under the symbol. The symbol is a polynomial. You push the curve by this polynomial. You push the unit circle by this polynomial. Yes. Not the time. No, so it might be that there is always a justification. Well, there is, no, no, let me go back. There is always one, right? Just, no, there is one. So if you take t plus n to the minus gamma g, and you take l of that, and you tell me that this goes to the ua, then yes, this is a perturbation. <laughs> this is a small perturbation that satisfies the condition. So take half of the plus. So the short answer is that I have always such a perturbation. The perturbation is then if conclusion of the theorem is true, then I have always such a random perturbation, just take a realization of this. So we have a good example of how the collaboration continues. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks to everybody, and thank you.